Let's set up Entity Framework database first using Pomelo for MySQL or MariaDB and your .NET Core project. If you liked the video afterward, please subscribe with that bell down below and let's get right into it and build your database first project. Create a .NET Core web project. I'm doing MVC as you can see, but you don't have to. In this example, we're gonna use .NET 5, but you could use .NET 6 or something else. Create your project with no authentication by default. Go ahead and open PowerShell. I have my developer PowerShell here inside Visual Studio. You're gonna to wanna to update your tool set for .NET. So that's .NET tool install dash dash global space .NET dash EF to get your tool set updated for Entity Framework. If you already have it installed, just change the install command to say update, press enter. If it fails, it might mean that you have a few misbehaving NuGet package sources. If that happens to you, just disable those NuGet package sources and try again. Let's install a couple of NuGet packages that we're gonna need in advance. So right-click your project, manage NuGet packages. Of course, you can install these with the command line. Sometimes it's nice to browse. You're gonna search for pomelo.entityframeworkcore.mysql. Should be the first result. Install the latest version. Next, Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.Design. Install the latest version. Now, do a save all. I just do Control Shift S and either clean or rebuild. So, going back to your PowerShell, you're going to want to navigate to the project folder. So in my case, I've got the project folder one more level in. Once you're in that project folder, it's now time to do our database first scaffolding. That is, I've got a database out there either in MariaDB or in MySQL, and I'm going to go ahead and scaffold it. So the command is going to be .NET space EF space DB context, or whatever you want to name your context, right? space, scaffold, space, and then we got our quotes. We're gonna put our connection string in there, put a space, use our quotes, and in here, we're gonna choose the library that we're using for this entity framework. In this case, it's gonna be pomelo.entityframeworkcore.mysql. Press return. A lot of times, if this fails, it will tell you which package that you forgot to install, and it might give you a warning if you didn't update your tool set that it's out of date. I recommend you update your tool set before you run this, of course. Now, the great thing about this output response here is it also notified me that my version is 10.4.12-MariaDB. If you're using MySQL, keep following along. Steps are exactly the same. Whatever that version number is, remember it. We're going to be using it in your startup.cs. Go to startup.cs and go down to the configure services method not to be confused with the configure method and we're going to go ahead and put in our connection string here i know you just use the connection string to generate the classes and the context when we we're doing a powershell but now the application needs to connect to the database when it's running that's what we're putting in here um, it is going to suggest to you to put the connection string somewhere else i highly recommend that you use the secrets microsoft secrets but there's a lot of ways to do this. and I'm not going to cover it in this video. I do have other videos on connection strings and entity framework that go into that in more detail. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Next up, let's go ahead and specify the version number. Now, if you're using MySQL, it's going to say new MySQL server version. If you're using MariaDB, it's going to say new MariaDB server version. I'll make that a little bigger for you. Do control dot while you're on the red underlined MySQL server version number and choose using Microsoft.Entity Framework Core. Should go green. Going back to PowerShell here, make sure that the version number here obviously matches. Go ahead and add your context. Now it's gonna be services.addbcontext. Uh, then it's gonna be the name of your context. I'll show you how to get that. And you're going to say DB context options equals DB context options as a lambda there. Very simple. 
The only property you need to start it off with is it's going to use MySQL. If you're using MariaDB, it still says use MySQL, okay? In my case, it's just party vote context. Party vote's an old app I had worked on. But the reason why it chose that name is I didn't specify it when I did the .NET EFDB context scaffold. I didn't specify the context name with an option there as you could have. So instead, it picked the name of my database in MariaDB or in MySQL. As you could see, I chose party boat as the database, and so it made party boat context. In my connection string, it says database equal party boat. Pretty simple, right? But if you open up the file that it created, the context file, which is just out here with all my tables from the database that it generated, which you could also specify a folder, I think it's dash O. Anyways, the context file will be one of them, and you can highlight the name of that file and drop it in, copy paste it over here in your add context. Now go to the class where you want to access your database. In my case, I'm gonna to go to a controller. In your case, it might be you know a database class or a database service, which would be most common. I'm gonna go into this privacy action in my controller and I'm gonna get data there. But the first thing I'm gonna do is put a local variable for my context up here. Same class name as we used in startup.cs. I'll use underscore context here. And in the constructor for my controller here, I'm going to go ahead and put it in here as well. Same thing, but we'll take off that underscore and assign that local variable from the parameter. So context equals context. Now, we can go ahead and get that data where we wanted it. In my case, I wanted it in this privacy method here. So I could say, and we'll put a breakpoint here so you can see the data. So I'll put my data equal to context. And as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, there is a class for each one of my tables that was generated when we ran that command line command. And one of my tables in my database is called votable item. So I'm gonna pick votable items. You can tell it pluralized for us, just like you would with SQL Server um, Entity Framework database first. I'm gonna hit dot. And now I this anything is available to you here now from link to SQL, except of course it's linked to MySQL, but it's the same concept. So we're gonna do select and I can do a Lambda and I can put in here um, one of the names of the columns, for example. And I'm not gonna do a whole lesson on link here, but I do have another video on link. Anything linked to SQL should be available here, not linked to object, but once we put it into an object, then you can do link to object as well on it. So one of the columns, one of the columns I have in that table is with to list, because that will execute the statement. If you're not familiar with entity framework at all, whenever you do to list on it, wherever you access the data in it and actually use it, it'll execute the query. It does that because it sometimes likes to continually build the query out with iQueryable. On that, I have other videos on Entity Framework and Link that could help you with that. Let's run it. Okay, I'm gonna click on Privacy, hit my breakpoint. I'm gonna hover on my data. As you can see, it pulled out 12 records from the database. That's how many there were in that because I didn't have any where clause selected. Not too bad. What if you change your database after you do all this and you need to update your models? Well, Microsoft has two suggestions for you. The first one is go into your models, make the changes yourself. That way, any of these generated files don't get lost when you rebuild them. I've got a better solution for you. Create another application, another project and run your generation there and copy over the things that you want. That way, if there are significant changes, it's not a big deal and you don't lose what you've done. However, if you want to just do the quick and dirty and just say, hey, I didn't make any modifications, you can run your command again and just add the dash dash force option. So if you look here down at the bottom of my screen, I've got the command that we used earlier. I could just do dash dash force at the end and press enter. 
Now any changes to the model will be updated, including any new columns that you've added. So that's the second option from Microsoft, which is to regenerate. Another idea from the community, you can check out the EF Core Power Tools extension, which gives you a context menu to add um, classes on the go. Well, this video was just to get you set up with Entity Framework, but no Entity Framework video is complete without at least writing some data back and reading some data. So we did read some data, so just really quickly, I will show you how to write some data back. But don't consider this an inclusive lesson. You'll want to check my other videos for that. From these models on the right-hand side of the screen that are classes representing tables in MySQL, I'm going to choose the vote class. New vote. We will instantiate that and we'll hit control space and give some properties, some values. Give the device ID, which is just a column again in my table. Control space. ID is on auto increment, is active, has a default value, but we'll, we'll just say it's true. Last change will be now. Always recommend having a last change column in your database tables, as well as a primary key of ID or something else. And, let's, and I often tell people to do is deleted as well. That way you can do soft deletes. And that should be all the required fields that I have. Oh, this should be a one. And now we can put our semicolon here. Now just creating the class is not going to insert it. We've got to go ahead and add that now. So let's go ahead and do boats or context and we will add this my boat and now we have to do context dot save changes save changes is a commonly overridden method in case you want to do any special things every time you save to the database if you guys are interested in that let me know and I'll make a video on it all right let's go ahead and run this And this is in the privacy method, so I've got to click on privacy to call that code. And I hit my breakpoint, which is past the saving, so I should be able to go out to the database now and see it. Just let that finish, though. So let's go to my votes table. And as you can see, today is the 23rd of October, 2021. So that's this record here. And there it is there. If you wanted to update a record, it's actually pretty similar. But first you got to select, pull it out, tell it which one it is that you want to update. I'll show you how to do that. It's quite simple. I'm going to keep the save changes here because we're going to use that. In fact, if you do a whole bunch of operations, you only need one save changes after the fact. But we're going to do it a little different. So let's do vote my vote, or you could even just use var, let the system figure out the type, my vote equal to context dot votes and now we can pick either we can either use select or we can use first or default we could use find there's a few choices you have here i'm going to use first or default and lambda and here i can like maybe select based on one column or a couple of columns you, you can use the and and ors in here lots of choices there in my case i'm going to look at the id column and I'm going to make sure that that is equal to 185, which is just the auto, auto increment ID that we just got from our last insert. All right, put your semicolon there. Now, because I use first or default, I always want to make sure that it's not null, because if there's nothing there, the default in this case is null. So let's just make sure. So if my vote is not equal to null, then we'll change the value. Say my vote dot and pick one of the columns that you want to change in the update. Why don't we say is active is false because we made it true earlier. Make it zero. It's a one. It's actually a one or zero column, so it's a, a long in this case. Very interesting. Anyways, so now let's save that changes using context.save changes. I will go ahead and fast forward. I'm sure you don't want to watch me. Click privacy again. So I'll just hit play and it'll be on the breakpoint. Boom. The breakpoint now. Let's go ahead and look in the database to see if we've made is active equal to zero. 
where the ID is 185. Come back over here, execute my select, is active, is zero, where the ID is 185. Great, that about sums up the setup. One last thing I just wanted to point out is that all the Entity Framework pieces apply. It doesn't matter that it's MySQL instead of SQL Server. For example, one of the huge ones, especially for those of you new to it, you're gonna watch this. If I go to one of my tables that has a foreign key, for example, vote is one of those tables in my database. Your database obviously should have some foreign keys as well if it's properly structured. When you did the generation with the PowerShell earlier, it should put a virtual and then the class name of the table that it's linked to with that foreign key at the bottom of your class. So that means you don't always have to do these crazy link statements when you need to join on things. Sometimes you can just reference from one table to the next. My only word of advice is always check that it's not null and use the include syntax when you need to. That wraps this up. If you guys want more detail on this, just tell me exactly what you're trying to do, what you're trying to learn. And if I know it, I'll make a video on it. Have a great day.